We've been on a journey over the past few months as we've been thinking about friendship and we've been thinking about what the Bible says about friendship. And I really encourage you to lean in, connect with people, build friendships. Um, friendships need investing into, don't they? Friendships about saying to people, let's meet for a coffee, let's come round, come round, have a meal. It doesn't need to be flashy. I, I've, I've shared this story before. My, uh, my dad grew up in, in public school and in, a, in quite a formality uh, of a home. And he was, a few years ago, he was feeling lonely. And I said, well, what? And he, he sings in a choir. I says, why, why don't you invite some of the people back for a coffee after? He said, oh, I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. I would have to do a yeah, I'd have to do it properly. I'd have to do it as a dinner party. I said, couldn't, couldn't you just have people back for a coffee and a jacket potato? He said, no, no, I can't, I can't have to do it properly. And we need to lean into friendship where we're able to walk in and maybe everything is perfect. But it's friends, it's connecting. And that's friendship across the church as we, as we connect with one another, we, as we encourage, encourage one another. We need to lean into that. And we had some wonderful teaching over we haven't recorded that, uh, but you, you, can, you can just pick up the sense of what we were looking at in terms of this idea of understanding friendship is about modeling like Jesus. Look at, what, look at how Jesus was a friend. But also friendship is being honest with one another, speaking truth into each other in a kind way. And we had that acronym THINK. Friendship is about not being led astray by the wrong friends. Friendship is about iron sharpening iron, being sharpened by each other, having friends who build us up. Last week, I thought about the fact that as, uh, we'll be this last week and next week, this week, looking at two stories of Jesus. Of last week, we looked at the the paralyzed man who was taken to Jesus by his friends. So friendship is about helping people meet Jesus, bringing people to Jesus. And I want us to think today about the fact that friendship is about talking about Jesus. How do we do that? Now, let's be honest. Who is really, really comfortable if I said the E word, evangelism? Who's, who kind of gets excited, gets a little buzz in them, and gets really, really interested? There's, you see, there's about five people. Who gets in place? Who gets a little bit over, overwhelmed or nervous when the word evangelism is mentioned? Okay, bit of prayer there needed. That's fine, because it is a difficult thing, and our brains do all sorts of funny things, but we don't need to have all the answers. As we, we'll see in what I just want to share, and then David will bring some stories as well from his experience, it's about talking about who Jesus is for us and bringing him into the conversation. And so I want us to think about talking about Jesus, and slightly strangely, I'm looking at a story of Jesus talking. He's not talking about himself, but he's talking. He's talking about God. And I just want to, mo I, I want to model this well-known story of Jesus with the woman at the well, and I've, I've picked out a few thoughts that teach us how we might talk about Jesus with others. So that's where we're going. Uh, so let's start by having a look at this story. I'm not doing the whole story. Um, you'll have to pick up on some bits if you want to. But let's just start on verse 4, on John 4. John chapter 4, verse 4. Now he had to go through Samaria. So Jesus had to, he was going a different way. He was going through the route that most of the Jews would avoid. And there's, there's a few story, a few extra bits about that. But Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Let me just pause there and we'll carry on with the rest of the story. A few simple thoughts or points. Number one. The power of noticing others. It's interesting. Rob started about talking about names. Or Eileen was talking about names. The power of a name. The power of being known. 
What do you like as you walk down the street? Are you a, uh, when you walk past someone? Are you a, a wave? Are you a, ignore them and look at my phone? Or are you a stop and have a conversation with them? How do you acknowledge or do you acknowledge people? If you saw someone, the awkward is where you see someone but you're not quite sure if it is or not and you think, what do I do? If you're like me, you cross over to the other side of the road so you can try and avoid them so you don't have to have that, that slightly awkward conversation of, do we know each other? But are you good at that? Are you good at acknowledging people? Maybe even if it's, even if it's to go from the step of uh, to morning. And just upping that relationship, that relational response with people is so, so important. Re- acknowledging others, seeing them. How many people do you walk past in a day? Are you someone that says hello to everybody or makes eye contact or connects or are you in your own little world? This would solve one of the problems that society seems to have last week they were talking about the the increase of theft of mobile phones because we've gone from connecting to others to looking at our phone while we walk why not look and connect and connect and say hello to people what about connecting to the routine if you work if you go to school you will have a routine and there will be people that you see every day every week on a routine, routine basis. Maybe you all catch the same bus. And there's the connecting with people on the routine. Maybe you are dropping kids off at the school and there's the connecting with people at the school gate. Maybe you have a dog and you go for a dog walk at the same time and you connect with people there. There are opportunities every day for us to connect with others. Uh, I can't understand this experience, but maybe if you go for a haircut, you're connecting with somebody. Um, A number of years ago, we had uh, uh, another friend evangelist who came and spoke here, a guy called Swanee. Swanee is a tattoo artist, but he's also an evangelist. They have to sit in his tattoo chair for hours, and he shares the gospel with them. And they have to come back for part two. And he continues to share the gospel. Now, I'm not saying take up tattoo artistic, but, but look at the ways. Think about what you are doing, how, how you can connect into your general routine. More importantly, though, make time for others. That's going from the uh, or the hi to how are you? Good to see you. And just developing a, a, a chance to pause or to have a question. I remember um, a few years ago when we were doing the outreach work in Arnold Market on a Saturday. Before that, I would go to Arnold and I would be on a mission. Because I had to go from one shop, you know, in the days of Wilco's, I had to get to Asda, I had to go into somewhere else. And it was, I'm walking. I'm not, I'm not going to, because I, I, I've got things to do. Suddenly, to be in a town centre for an hour, two hours, in one place. It's amazing the number of conversations you have because you've made time for somebody. Now, I'm not saying you'll have a two hours, but can you take that morning further and add an, a minute or two in the conversation as you're connecting with other people? Jesus made time for this woman. He, he saw her, he recognized her, he connected with her. And then as we've already heard, use and remember names. Names are so, so powerful. Now, Jesus doesn't use the name here, so I'm, I'm adding that one in. But use and remember names. Secondly, connect with the moment. There's something about this story where Jesus connects, as we'll see as the conversation develops. He talks about water. They're by a well. They, he's connecting with the moment that they are in. Don't be cheesy about it. But is there a way of bringing conversation into that moment, into where you are, using relevant language? Be careful of the words you use. I mean, we would understand this phrase, but I would never encourage you to use this in in a conversation on the streets or in your home. Have you been washed by the blood of the Lamb? It's language we know, but it's a little bit weird. So... Think about the language that you use. You are 
talking to people that are potentially from a non-biblical literal literacy situation. Let me put a stat on that. The Bible Society, about 10 years ago, did some research on, both on the stories that people knew, and, but this is the interesting one. They, 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 they had some modern-day stories, and they asked people if these originated in the Bible. So are these based on biblical stories? 54% of the respondents thought that the Hunger Games originated from the Bible. 34% thought Harry Potter was based on biblical stories. Be careful of the language we use because people may not understand it. Let's carry on in our story. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will be in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. You see how he's using the analogy of water and weaving that in. But also, what else? Bringing God into the conversation. If you're in a workplace situation, if you're dropping kids off, there's a regular routine. Do those people that you're connecting with know you're a Christian? Is there anything that you are doing? I don't mean that's because you've got a nice big cross badge or, or uh, something like that, but because of your language or your conversation, are you dropping st- what you, you know, who you are and your faith into conversation? A great starter in a workplace or something is, what did you do this weekend? To ask someone that question, and when they ask you, well, what did you do? Don't say, oh, nothing, because this is just routine. I just go, you could say, well, on Saturday and then Sunday I went to church oh, I didn't realize you went to church. You see how easy it is to drop God into the conversation so people are aware of you and your faith. You can also drop in stories of what he's done for you. We'll see that in a moment. And, but just, just a few little thoughts and stories, and again, I'll, I'll pick up on testimony in the next little section. Keep the stories simple. Keep them current. Keep them short. Keep them simple. Keep them current. Keep them short. Talk about stories of this week, last week, last month, not 20 years ago. Keep them simple. Keep them an understandable story. Keep them short. It's not an epic that you are telling people. You are just sharing some stories of what Jesus has done for you. Some simple ways to connect in. Let's just carry on. Jesus told her, go call your husband and come back. I I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Really quickly, I haven't got time to dwell on this one, but the role of spiritual gifts. The role of spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts work within the church. They also work within the general meeting points. But a few simple things, that particularly those who are on the Alpha Trading would have heard. Be naturally supernatural. Be careful of what you might do in a church wouldn't, would feel a little bit weird when you're talking to someone on the streets or in your home. Be naturally supernatural. It's a natural thing just to be able to say, well, can I pray for you? Or to, to listen to God. But I think this is a key one personalize. If you sense that you feel that God is saying something for that person, you have a word for them, don't say, thus says the Lord, or God says, personalize it. I think that God might be saying this to you. I think I sense that God might be wanting this. You see how that then personalizes it rather than putting the, the pressure on God says which is almost a, 
you know, a bit of a deal breaker. So just be sensible and uh, normal as much as you can. The role of spiritual gifts, let's just move on to the last little bit. So then leaving her water jug, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I have ever done. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and made their way to him. Let me finish on this. It's the power of your story. Your story of what God has done is the powerful thing. She doesn't preach to these people. She just says, she tells her story. You see how quickly, easily she tells her story. She tells her story, and people want to know more. A few years ago, we did some training here from the Message Trust, and I loved this. They, they talked about a six-word testimony. What is your testimony in six words? Two words before, before you met Jesus, two words that describe you meeting Jesus, and two words that describe where you are now. Now, the power of a six-word testimony, as I'll show you in a minute, you could, you could say it within under a minute, and you then have people saying, oh, tell me more, rather than, actually, I'm a little bit bored of your story now. Or there may be words that they go, I want that word. I want to experience that for me. Tell me more. So, for example, I, I was thinking for myself, um, what's my testimony in six words or a uh, under a minute. I think before I met Jesus, I was confused and alone. I was asking a lot of questions. I was thinking, but I was thinking, you know, what is the purpose of life? I was doing all these big questions. But then when I encountered Jesus or met him for the first time, I found truth. I suddenly found truth that I could understand, but I think more than that, I found family. I, I was no longer alone. I felt part of something. And now, Having lived with Jesus, I have a real sense of hope. I have a hope, a a, a positivity of what what he will bring. But I also have purpose. I know who I am. I know what I'm about. That's my testimony. Six words. Two words before, two words meeting, two words after. Think for yourself. What might those six words be? Before I met Jesus, I was dot, dot. But then when I met him, I found dot, dot. And now I'm dot, dot. Because someone hearing that said, oh, I want to know purpose in my life. Tell me more. I felt confused. How did you find that? How did you understand truth? I felt alone. I feel alone. Tell me more about what this family, what does that feel like? And it gives people a question to start to follow further into. Real simple thoughts from that story of of encountering Jesus, of how we might have those conversations with others. Look at the power of noticing people. Look around at the people, the routines you're already in, the power of noticing others. We thought about connecting with the moment bringing God into the conversation, the role of spiritual gifts being attuned to what God might be saying into a circumstance, and the power of your story is so, so important. I'm going to pause there. I'm going to invite David forward. David is someone that I I met a few months ago. Uh, For those of you, was, was anyone down at the Good Friday service? Some of you were down at the Good Friday services here. You'd have heard David speaking there absolutely brilliantly, sharing the gospel in such a, such a clear way. David is an evangelist. I've invited him because I see that role of, in Ephesians 4. It talks about the gift to the church of pastors, prophets, teachers, evangelists. Uh, and so I see that in David. I recognize that in him, and I'd love us to welcome him as that. So can we give him a warm welcome as he comes forward to share a few thoughts with us? Thank you, sir. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for your... Oh, I like that enthusiasm. Who, who said that? That's a really enthusiastic welcome at the back there. I like that. Wonderful. It's really great to be here uh, with you this morning, Mark. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's, it's always a privilege to uh, come among uh, brothers and sisters that we are, amen, 
and uh, to be united together. So it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I, I did say to Mark not long after I walked in the church this morning, you know, because this is my first time here, uh, last night I thought I would just have a little peek on YouTube just to find out what the dress code was. But, but by the sound of your announcements, it, it's the dress code for your Zoom prayer meetings I, I need to be a bit concerned about, not not church, but... To, uh, it, it's really wonderful to be with you uh, this morning, as I say. Let, I, I wanted to share a few things about evangelism. Um, you know, you, let me first say this. You know, when, whenever I hear of a church looking at evangelism, I get very excited, and I'll tell you why. Because if there's one thing the church does that gets at the heart of why Jesus came, it is evangelism. Amen. And I'll tell you why that is, because when we look at the scripture, we don't see the reason why Jesus came to this world was to give us nice, comfortable churches to sit in. He didn't come for that reason. He didn't come so we could enjoy nice coffee and lovely, lovely tea after the service. That's important, by the way. I'm, I've seen the biscuits out there. They're good. But he didn't come for that reason. Why did he come? The Bible tells us Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? And he done it. He came to this world. He went to the cross to die for the sins of the world, that through him we can be saved. And then he ascended into heaven. So what does he do now? He looks at you and me as his church, and he sends you and me to seek the lost so he can save them. Amen. Jesus is still the Savior. He is the only one that can save Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? Just one, thing I, uh, one more thing I want to say before I go to practical stuff. You know, uh, uh, if, if you went... Uh, today I asked the street about on, on the street about the importance of the church. People are going to dismiss the church today. It's it's old, you know. Maybe has some uh, you know uses at weddings and funerals, but but it's not really important. Don't don't believe that. You, you know the church. The, the world doesn't know this, but the world desperately needs the church. The world desperately needs you, my friend, and it desperately needs me. And I will tell you why. It's similar to a drowning man in a river desperately needing a lifeguard. Why? Because a drowning man, only, only hope of life is for the lifeguard to take the life ring and throw it to him so he can be saved. A drowning man desperately needs a lifeguard. And in the same way, even though the world doesn't know it, the world desperately needs the church. Why? Because it's you and me. As God's children, that Jesus has called, he has given this commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to take the lifeline of the gospel and launch it out on the streets, launch it in the schools, launch it in the shops, in the offices, wherever we may be, to launch the gospel so those who are lost can take hold of it and can be saved. Amen? Guys, we are given such an important role, such an important task. We dare not sit back. And not fulfill what Jesus had called us to do. And we know that, don't we? We don't have to read too much in the Bible until we realize, guys, Jesus has given us a task to do. He's given us a role to do, to go and take the good news of Jesus. We know that, amen? We all know that? We all know that. But the question is, how do we do it? And I think this is the big one that stops the church from evangelizing. The big one that strikes fear in our hearts when it comes to evangelism. We don't know how to do it. We know we should but we don't know how. Well, I just want to share a few ideas this morning. We've already heard from Mark. This is the trouble about when, when you're the second speaker on. You think, goodness, I've got to be as good as this guy now. It's, uh, it's not easy. <laughs> I just want to share a few ideas with you this morning. You see, how do we evangelize? Well, one of the good places to look, we've looked at a, a great story uh, from Jesus this morning. Another place is the book of Acts. You know, I love the book of Acts. It's a wonderful book. You know what I believe? I believe, uh, 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 what, <laughs> let me put it this way, I long for the day when the churches in this country, when their newsletters are like reading the book of Acts. Because I think that's how it should be working, amen? <laughs> but when we read the book of Acts, we, we read about the mission of the early church. Now, these were the guys who were with Jesus. These were the guys who received the Great Commission. These were the guys that physically spent three years with Jesus, watching and learning how to do what Jesus had called them to do. What do we see when we see the new church, the early church, witnessing? How, how do they do it? Well, firstly, let, let me just say what we don't see, and it may surprise us. What we don't see the early church doing, when they go out to reach people with the gospel, we don't see them going to people and saying, now listen, God loves you, God loves you. 
In fact, if you read the book of Acts, you won't hear the early church telling people that God loves them. You won't read it once. And let today, we think, oh, that, that's what we've got to do. God, go and tell them God loves them. God loves them. You, you, won't, you won't read the early church going into the uh, uh, highways and byways and uh, reaching the lost and telling them, listen, God just wants a relationship with you. Pleading with people. You don't read that in there. They're not, they don't do it. Why not? What, what you do read is this. It's interesting. Uh, at the beginning of the book of Acts, you read the, the, the early church going in simply presenting who Jesus is as the Messiah. Then we get to the first evangelistic sermon to the Gentiles. From Acts chapter 10 onwards, what do we see the early church presenting Jesus as? You know what it is? One of the main things? As judge. Think about that for a moment. How many people here when you evangelize are very keen on presenting Jesus as a judge? We, we, we don't like that. <laughs> it's a bit uncomfortable. But read the book of Acts. It's in there. The early church present Jesus as the judge. What are they doing? They're focus on, focusing on eternity. Saying, guys, no matter what is going on at the moment, the day is coming when you're going to have to stand before Jesus as judge. The day is coming when you're going to have to face eternity. Here's an important principle, folks, when it comes to evangelism. The good news of Jesus Christ can only truly be appreciated when first the bad news is understood. It's very important that. Because if there's one mistake we make in evangelism, it's this. We rush to the good news. But the trouble is if people don't understand why they need the good news, it makes no sense to them. Jesus died for you. I, Okay, that's, that, that's wonderful. I, I don't need that. I'm fine. God loves you. Okay, yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. I'll carry on with my life. You see, it's a little bit like this. If you, if you go to your doctor and he sits you down in, in, in his uh, surgery and he says, Now listen, I've come up with this wonderful vaccine and it's going to cure this, this, uh, this disease. And he names this disease and he gives you the vaccine. You're going to walk away with that vaccine and you're going to say, Okay, well, that's... That's interesting. Congratulations, Mr. Doctor, and you're not going to be in the vaccine. Why? He's just giving you the good news. But imagine if you went into the doctor's surgery, you sat down, and the GP said to you, now listen, first I've got some bad news for you. I can see by these various symptoms, and he begins to list the symptoms, these spots that you've got on you, your sleeplessness, the, the aches and pains you have. And he starts to go down the list of your symptoms. And then he says, this is your problem. You have this disease. You understand the bad news. And then he says to you, but it's okay. I've got a vaccine for you. All of a sudden, the vaccine makes sense. Why? Because you first understood that you've got a problem. And the doctor gives you the answer. And the answer is the vaccine. Friends, you know, evangelism isn't just about telling the good news. <laughs> I, th I think the danger can be, I, I, I hope I say this, I think sometimes the danger can be if we just give the world the good news, we inoculate them against the gospel. Because they don't understand why they need it. But if we give them the bad news, followed by the good news, suddenly it makes sense. And, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of sharing the gospel hundreds of times with hundreds of people out on the streets, and we've seen it happen time and time again. Suddenly, atheists that have said, no, I'm an atheist. By the end, they've understood the gospel and they've seen their need of it. Because we take the time to give them the bad news. Well, how do we do that? Well, it, 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 it turns out that the Bible talks about a tool that uh, God has given us that will help us give the bad news in, just pick up on what Mark said, a loving and kind way. Amen? If you give somebody the bad news, you don't have to be horrible about it. <laughs> we do it because we love people. Let, let me read from 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. This is what it says. It says, but we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous person, but for the lawless and insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners. Think about that a moment. The law. We, we understand the law, the Old Testament, commandments. Well, the Bible says here that they're not for the righteous. In other words, they're, they're not for you and me in the sense of we are not saved by obedience to the law. Amen. We're saved by grace through faith. 
So what is the law for? Well, according to Paul, the law is for sinners. Let me ask that question. How many people have used the law in evangelism? <laughs> Someone has. Wonderful. But it's in there. Well, how does that work? Well, well Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, I think it is. He says, he says, basically, he wouldn't have known sin if it wasn't for the law. What does the law do? The law is like the GP sitting us down and pointing out our problem, saying to us, listen, you have a problem. And when people understand that, and they understand their need, we can come in with the good news. Let me just give you a practical demonstration of how we do that. Um, you know, when I go, it's one of the uh, favorite questions I like to ask people is, is simply this. If heaven exists, are you good enough to go there? Do you know why that's such an important question? It's such an important question because it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what your situation in life is. It doesn't matter whether you're a millionaire or a homeless person. That one question of eternity is the greatest question you will ever face. Because every other problem, every other issue we have in this life is only a temporary problem. But the issue of where you and I are going to spend eternity is the greatest issue we ever face. And I want to tell you, folks, it doesn't matter who you come across. It doesn't matter who you meet. You already know they've got this problem. And that is one day they've got to face God on Judgment Day. And they've got to face eternity. And it affects every single person. And that question, I find, gets to the heart of the issue. Guys, yeah, if heaven exists, are you good enough to go there? I don't know what you think here when that question sat there, but let me tell you. By far, by far, by far, the majority of people who we ask that question to are more than happy to answer it because it's not threatening. You're not going up to somebody and saying, listen, you're on the way to hell, brother. You need Jesus. No, 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 no. You're probably going to be a broken jaw if you try that. You just come out to people in love and say, listen, if heaven exists, you're not even making a truth claim at this point. You're not saying, heaven exists, you better get right with God. Did you feel convicted there, sister? I like the look of your face. No, 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 you're not saying, this is, listen, if heaven exists, are you good enough to go there? And by far the majority of people are so happy to talk about that question. And most people will say, well, you know, if there is a heaven, I hope so. <laughs> well, don't we all? Then what do we do? We use the tool that Paul gave us, the law, to show them how no one is good, no, not one. Second question I'd like to ask for that one is, is, is this. I said, you know, Jesus said this. He said, he said that we have to be perfect as God is perfect. Now, if that's the standard to get into heaven, do you think you are as perfect as God is? <laughs> Most people will say no. Some people, I had, I had one, uh, I think it was a lady the other day on the street, she said yes. Okay, you don't know God then. But that's not a problem if they do. Why? Because we use the law to point out that we've not been. Just the Ten Commandments. Well, listen, have if, if you ever told a lie? Yeah, yeah I've, I've told a lie. Okay, so have I. That means I've broken the law. Have you, have you ever stolen something, no matter, no matter how small it is? Oh, yeah, I can, I can remember when I was a kid. Maybe I stole something from my sister or, or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I, I can remember going into a, a, a shop when I was a kid and stealing some chocolate. I, I did do that, Mark. Sorry. I'm okay to carry on. I'm not chucked out of the chair. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> I, I'm glad you understand grace here. <laughs> If you ever looked with lust, if you ever blasphemed, what are we doing? We're, we're being that GP by the help of the Holy Spirit that points out the symptoms of our problem with sin. And when people realize that by their own efforts they have not been good enough to go to heaven, that's when we can come with the good news. And one of the questions we, we ask people as well on the streets is simply this. Well, think about it. If, if we have not met that perfect standard, to heaven if we cannot get there by our own efforts how can God allow imperfect sinners like you and me into heaven and the answer we back we want back from there is I don't know and I'll tell you one of the most exciting times for me when, especially doing one-to-one -one evangelism is when I when I hear someone who doesn't know Christ come to the end of themselves and realize they can't save themselves why because when they're at that point they're ready for the gospel 
When they realize that I can't, I actually, no, I can't be good enough. Actually, if there is a God, if there is a heaven, I have sinned against him. And yeah, if, if he gives me what I deserve, it's, it's not heaven, it's, it's hell for eternity. When they realize that, praise God. It's such a beautiful moment because they're ready for the gospel. One of my favorite illustrations when it comes to the gospel is simply this. I, I, I say to people, just, just imagine that you've broken the law. And there's a massive fine that you have to pay. The trouble is you can't afford, no way can you afford to pay it. Just about to put you in prison for a very long time. Somebody walks in, takes out their checkbook, pays the fine for you in full. If you accept that fine, what will happen to you? Will you still go to prison or go free? They'll be, well, well I'll go free. Of course I will. Someone's paid your fine. Say, Absolutely. You'll go free, not because you've paid it, because you can't afford to pay it. You go free because someone else has paid it for you. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ done on the cross. That the perfect God came to this world in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect life. And because he was perfect, he could go to the cross and die in your place, and he could die in my place to take our sin, the punishment we deserve upon himself. And because Jesus Christ done that, we can go free. Not because we've earned it, not because we've been religious enough, not because we've been to church enough, simply based on the fact that Jesus Christ paid it for us. Isn't that wonderful news? Hallelujah. Oh, friends, let's never, never get used to the gospel. It's overwhelming the heart of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the sinless Son of God, died for my sin so I could be forgiven. So I could go free. And then he conquered death when he rose from the dead to bring us eternal life. So many people we've seen, so many precious people on the streets. We've seen taken through this and come to the end and they've understood the gospel. Because they've seen their need and they've seen the answer. We, we, we use that with complete strangers. I, I, call, I like to call it train station evangelism. You know why? Because if you're going to evangelize at a train station, you've got five minutes with them, then they need to go and cut a train. <laughs> and maybe, maybe in the context of today's message, when, when you're talking about relationships and friendships, you, you might not want to be quite that direct. Maybe you do. One. But maybe you don't. But hopefully there's some principles in there that you can take in your mind and think, okay, in this conversation... How can I share with them that, that none of us are good enough? That how can I present the problem? How can I get to the heart of the matter is where are you going to spend eternity? How can I do that? And let me, let me tell you, friends, if, if, we, if we love people, people will see that as you're talking to them. If you, if you really love people, people will see that. Let me just finish with two, two illustrations and then, and then we're going to pray if that's okay, Mark. Let me, let me first say this. You know, do, do, you, do you have a treasurer here, church treasurer? Do you, you do, okay. You're not going to point him out, I know. But let's, let's just say, <laughs> let's just say if, if the church treasurer for a moment, after the service this morning, came and stood up the front and said, listen, church, we've got good news. We have had a very large donation in this church. And what it means is that for every single person you share the gospel with this week, we are going to be able to pay you 50 pounds. Come to church next week with the total number you've, you've shared the gospel with, and we're going to pay you £50 per person. Now, how many of us, if we were told that, would suddenly be able to overcome our fear of evangelism? I know I would. How many of us would suddenly feel very, very inspired and prepared to pay the cost to go out and reach strangers with the gospel? Because you're like, wow, I'm going to get paid 50 quid for every person I speak to. I wonder if I would. But here's the challenge, friends. If we can sit here this morning, we think, yeah, you know what? I could deal with my fear of evangelism. I could deal with my, my, my unwillingness to go and evangelize. I could, I could deal with it for the love of money. <laughs> How much more should we be able to deal with those things for our love of people and our love of God? The Bible says the love of Christ compels us. 
And if we have the love of Christ in our hearts, first, a love for God to be obedient to what he's commanded us to do. And secondly, a love for people who are facing a lost eternity in hell. Unless we reach them, unless they hear the gospel, then the love of Christ will compel us to go and preach the gospel. Hallelujah. Let me just finish with one encouragement. You know, as Christians, we're looking forward to that day when we get to heaven. Amen. Some of you look like you are anyway. (laughs) Imagine that day for a moment when we're stood, we've passed this temporary life and we're stood before our Savior, face to face, Jesus. And we're going to be able to sing to him for eternity. Man, that's going to be awesome. That's going to be wonderful. But just imagine a moment as you're there worshiping Jesus. Suddenly you feel a tap on your shoulder and you turn around and somebody has stood there and they say to you, listen, listen, do you, do, do you, do you recognize me? Do you remember me? And, and you look, look them up and down and you say, no, no, I don't. Who are you? I don't, I don't recognize you. And they say to you, I was that person who you took the time to have a conversation with. I was that person who you took the time to first explain the problem and then you gave me the answer. And you never saw me again. You had one conversation with me. That's all you had. You never, ever saw me again. But what happened on that day when you told me your story and when you shared the gospel with me, what happened on that day was that you planted a seed in my heart that God used to bring me to salvation. And here I am, saved for all eternity because we stepped out for Jesus and we planted that seed. Friends, let me tell you, if that happens when we're in heaven, you and I won't sit back and say, well, you know, I wish we didn't evangelize. I really wish that, we, that we'd done some other things. No, no, no. I'll tell you, we will kick ourselves wishing we'd done it more when we're faced with eternity, when we realize what's at stake. Here's the great news. When we look at, I know, I know, I know, I, know, I don't know whether Mark's the same, but, you know, you've got to have at least two final points, haven't you? you know? so, so this, when we, when we, read through scripture you know the people Jesus called he he didn't call the great theologians he didn't call the brightest he called ordinary fishermen people like you and like me he called us you know why because ordinary people are all Jesus has to use ordinary people like you and me when we place ourselves in the master's hand by the power of the spirit and are prepared to step out for Jesus take that risk and go and preach the gospel, we can see lives transformed for all eternity. Can we say amen? Hallelujah. I want to pray for some people. I wonder if it's possible just to have the, 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 the guy on the keyboard. I don't know if he's still around. Is it possible to? Thank you, brother. Just, just, just to play a little in the back, background. I want everyone's eyes just now just to, just to be closed together as we, uh, as we seek the Lord together. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus came to seek and save that which is lost. And now he looks at us. He still wants to save them because he came to be the savior of the world. Not the few. He came to be the savior of the world. And it's amazing that God looks at me and he includes me in his mission. You and me in his mission. He said, guys, I want you to go and see them. I want you to go to the highways and the byways. I want you to go into your schools. I want you to go into your colleges. I want you to go into your workplaces. I want you to go onto the streets, into the supermarkets where they have never heard the name of Jesus. And I want you to take my gospel to them. Wow. Ordinary people. And here's the great thing Jesus promises us as he sends us that he goes with us. And as we go, he will back us because his Holy Spirit is with us. I want to pray for some people this morning. If, If If you want to answer this morning yes to Jesus, using you, however however that looks like for you, I'm not not saying you've got it all understood. I'm not saying, oh, great, yes, that's it. No more fears. No, no, no. Just you want to say yes, Jesus, use me. Use me for the reaching of the lost. I want you just to stand to your feet right now, and we're going to pray together. God bless you. God bless you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If, if it's possible, there's, there's quite a few stood. I don't know how we're going to do this for room, but I want to lay hands on people. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're in a church that believes in that. 
and we're going to believe for an impartation this morning. There's a wonderful passage of scripture that says, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And you know that why that's important? Because it's important that we get it, that it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but it's by his spirit that we can see this world transformed. Hallelujah. And this morning I'm going to believe for an impartation. The fire of evangelism will be lit in this church, will be lit in these hearts. There will be a new fire in this church that you will see the, the lost saved. You will go out into the highways and the byways. You will have a new boldness to preach the gospel. You will have a new boldness to tell your story. You will have a new boldness to lay hands on the sick and you will see them recover here in church. Yes, amen, but out on the streets. Out on the streets. Hallelujah. If you want me to pray for you, just leave your seats now. Come and stand at the front. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you as you come. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus. As you come, I'm just going to ask one thing simply. Just, just take your eyes off of the preacher. Take your eyes off anything else and just get them focused on Jesus. And just begin to tell him. Lift your, lift your hands, close your eyes, and let's just begin to worship him. Begin to thank him for his gospel. You can still come, still come. If you want me to come, come to you, that's no problem. If you want to stay there, that's no problem. Come on, just begin to tell him. Just begin to lift your voice. Just begin to worship him. Thank him for his gospel. And like Isaiah, say, Lord, here am I. Send me, Lord. Send me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Fill me with your fire, Lord. I'll never be the same.